the second phase of our panel is a, a sort of a tag team duo of uh, colleagues Murray Gold and Simon Archer, uh, who are pension lawyers, both associated with the firm Kosky Minsky. I know probably some of you in the room uh, either know them or have heard of them, uh, and I won't uh, offer too lengthy uh, an introduction for them. Uh, I could because I've actually worked with Murray for, for many years, and Simon. Uh, we've collaborated more recently in my role as, as a researcher for CUPE. Uh, so let me just say, both of these guys are uh, very experienced pension lawyers, labor side pension lawyers, who have, I think, really important experience to share working directly with a whole array of unions that have to contend with these issues, unions that name uh, trustees to pension boards, unions that collectively bargain over their pensions, and other uh, related roles. Um, so if anyone can offer us, I would suggest, uh, a sort of a trade union side perspective uh, on these issues of fiduciary duty, what does it mean, how is it interpreted, is it a constraint, is it empowering, as we're often told, uh, I think it's it's the two of them, and they've got a, a format uh, worked out for how they will cover a set of issues um, to help us uh, grapple with this uh, this afternoon. Um, I have a two hat problem. I am not just a practicing lawyer, but I'm also a teacher, a lecturer, and I teach trusts and pension law sometimes. Uh -huh. And I'm going to spin a story from the academic hat side, not the legal advice. Uh, side, which Murray will probably get into a little more deeply and might say something about lawyers. Uh, Kevin asked me to introduce sort of the background, the history of two things. One um, is uh, fiduciary duty, where it came from, and um, then Murray will talk a little bit about uh, the specific uh, lines of case law for uh, investment and SRI issues and what the content of that duty will be. Uh, I alluded to it a couple of times, uh, rate of return or something else, or both. And, when can those things be considered by people with fiduciary duties. Then I'll come back up quickly and talk about universal ownership and uh, what that informs in um, old and new debates about shareholder empowerment and the fiduciary concept as it's being discussed in the primarily academic literature today. Um, but that debate is broadening out. So I should be about 10 minutes with the background of uh, fiduciary duties. Uh, sometimes people are uh, surprised to learn that the English uh, legal system, which became the Canadian legal system when uh, we were colonized, uh, uh, actually had two legal systems inside it, not one. It had a system called the common law and a system called equity. And they had separate courts and they ran separately and depending on the kind of dispute you had with a property owner or a beneficiary of a trust or something like that, you would go to one court or the other. And in fact, the uh, system called equity uh, was administered by the, the uh, Lord Chancellor and his cabinet, um, a bunch of clerks, a bunch of lawyers, and they would dispense justice from uh, that court, which often conflicted with or overrode or corrected anomalies in the common law system, uh, which was a more general place where you could take disputes in England. And these two systems existed in parallel since at least the 1400s and still exist actually functionally. There's a debate amongst academics and judges as to whether these two systems are now completely mixed or represent distinct streams within a single legal system. And there's one set of courts administering both types of law, but both types of law are kept quite distinct in some decisions. And other judges will say, no, no, they're completely mixed. If you have a common law problem, I've got an equitable answer, or vice versa. And so the foray and the current uh, chief justice actually used to have long debates about that. Um, but the, the importance uh, here is that the, the court of equity was a court of conscience and it had wide discretion to uh, award remedies in disputes that didn't, they didn't have in common law. And one of its main lines of business uh, early on was the administration of trusts. And uh, a trust was an invention of uh, the court of equity which permitted the separation of a legal ownership of a piece of property, the primary one at the time was land or an estate, and the beneficial ownership or the, the right to the benefits of that property over time. So this was a, a beneficiary and a legal owner, which later became a trustee and a beneficiary. And the duty that the trustee owed to the beneficiary was a fiduciary duty, a duty of loyalty, a duty to act in that person's best interests. 
It actually came out of the Crusades when uh, noblemen would uh, run off and uh, slaughter folks in the Near East, and, and, when, and when they wanted to hand over their um, uh, estates for sort of temporary safekeeping, so when they come back, hopefully, uh, they could come and find their affairs in good order and well taken care of. And, uh, and uh, so they needed a way to enforce the promise to look after their property, hence the separation of the beneficial ownership and the legal ownership they transferred to someone. And then they, they come back and the legal owner at common law wouldn't have to surrender the estate again. But in the court of, uh, in the chancery court, in the court of equity, the, the king would enforce that beneficial ownership and that's where fiduciary duty came from. There was a sort of faith element to it in that way, or faithfulness element. Um, and so that's where we get it from originally. Uh, it, the, the concept, uh, the fiduciary principle, the fiduciary concept gets applied everywhere that trusts find themselves, and even beyond trusts in Canada in the late 20th century, which I'll tell you about very quickly in a second. But uh, that trusts were such a popular invention, you could do so many things with them that pretty soon they became used in a lot of different places, in family planning and tax dodging. The church actually used it itself to avoid paying taxes on property for a long time. And um, eventually, as uh, capitalism develops, it becomes a tool of organizing businesses, of organizing partnerships, of people getting money together and, and investing in things. And then by the time we get into the 20th century, um, we have the use of um, big trusts as conglomerates, and then we got antitrust legislation in the states, and then up in Canada it's called the Competition Act now, the enforcing principles um, important to the market economy. And trusts, of course, used in employee pensions and benefits arrangements throughout the 20th century. And the fiduciary principle was adapted throughout all this time to each different context, but maybe, at least it will be my kind of contention in my two sets of remarks today, that it might have met its match in the administration of complex benefit plans that are going to be asset holders in uh, oligopolistic conditions. We'll get to that hopefully at the end. But before we get there, just a quick word about how the fiduciary concept, and I'll turn it over to Murray to drill down, um, created some investment rules and what the what the investment uh, uh, context was and, uh, that, that leads up to and how this principle was played out that leads up to the modern pension fund having to make decisions and having fiduciary duty trotted out to tell you what you can and can't take into consideration when you make an investment decision. In, in the traditional context, in that family planning and estate context, uh, a, a trustee would have a duty to preserve property and maybe even make income on that property and they would typically be trying to decide how to balance investment objectives between a capital and an income beneficiary. So someone who's going to receive the property at the end, maybe the heir, the primogenitor heir, and maybe someone who has kind of a life interest, an income interest in the, uh, in the property uh, during life, so the spouse who might need income to support him or her, or be her back then, uh, 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 during their lifetime. And that would be the investment problem in the fiduciary, uh, there's case law built up applying the fiduciary duty in that context, saying what you must take into consideration and not in balancing those interests. And interestingly enough, in those circumstances, you could know exactly who the beneficiaries were, what their interests were, and what their specific needs were, and you could do a kind of balancing like that. And the fiduciary concept was, sufficiently malleable to permit you to do that and permit a judge every now and then to come by and say, well, you made a right decision or a wrong decision given all the factors that you should have known at the time. Something you can't do in the modern business context where you might have five or 10,000 beneficiaries, all of whom have very different interests from time to time. By the time we get to modern business uses, and this is really kind of a couple of final points before I turn to Murray, uh, we have that problem. Large numbers of beneficiaries, um, a system of law generated really for dealing with family planning issues and not coping with these large modern business contexts. And so one of the things that uh, happened in the early 20th century for life insurance funds as well as pension funds as they begin to form and, um, is that they regulate the investment behaviors of, uh, of uh, these funds or the, the trustees of these funds and they developed what we call a, uh, a legal for life list of investments. So you'd have literally a list in a statute somewhere that said, here's what you're permitted to invest in. And they would be blue chip stocks and government securities and other things. And there's sort of a capital preservation bias to that list, but also quite conservative. There wasn't a, uh, it was before modern portfolio theory. It was before any of the um, 
uh, modern ways of understanding how investments will relate to liabilities. Um, and it was also sort of a safe harbor approach. If you put, if you did everything you're supposed to on the list, then you couldn't be held accountable for having uh, made a poor investment at one time, which was a problem in trust law in the early 20th century. You have a bunch of different cases popping up where beneficiaries would pick and choose your investment decisions and say, oh, that was a real uh, boner that you picked in Nortel there, but we quite like your RIM investment. <laughs> and, and courts had trouble for a while. coping with that. Yeah, of course, everything changes. And courts had trouble coping with that. And there's some cases in which she would be held accountable, not on a, a portfolio basis, which we do now, but on an individual investment basis. And that distinction between portfolio um, and individual investments comes back to haunt in different places. Um, and then once, uh, I guess, Markowitz and others invent uh, portfolio theory, we have an economic rationale for approaching investment decisions that looks at the portfolio, and I'm sure you've talked about it or we'll talk about it a bit more, and you have legal uh, standards applying to those decisions, morphing once again, and we move from the legal for life list um, to a prudence rule, and Murray's going to talk a little bit more in detail about this so that uh, the standard that you have to meet is not have you met the number of uh, the investments on the list, but have you, all things considered in the portfolio, made a prudent uh, decision in investing in this group of securities, maybe even this one security, if that's the way you're going to try and run the case. Um, and so that's the background to how a fiduciary duty looks at, um, at the investment decision in a big sort of overview way. Um, and I think Murray's now going to focus in on the line of cases that talk about non-financial interests from time to time as they may apply to that decision. Okay, so thank you for the setup. And let me just say a couple of things before I talk a little bit about how courts today deal with questions of non-financial interest, which is really, I think, the subject matter of the, uh, the seminar. First thing is to, to sort of bring the fiduciary concept down, down to where we deal with it uh, at, at, say, a pension board. Uh, you'll know that the law is sort of rooted in 19th century liberalism, that it views individuals as rational uh, yeah, pursuers of their own desires and self-interests. Basically, that's the, the, the legal juridical person that the law typically assumes and deals with. And contract law is the most brilliant illustration of how that all plays out. Two individuals come together, they bargain with each other, they make a mutually desirable deal, they seal it, the court will enforce it. Each party of that contract looks after themselves. Everybody understands that. You sit down at a table with someone opposite, they're looking after their interests, you're looking after yours. If you do a deal together, terrific. If you don't, you can walk away. In the fiduciary context, we're dealing with something completely different. It's completely exceptional to that model. Because the essence of the fiduciary obligation is that you do not look after your own interests. You look after the interests of someone else. You know, maybe during the Crusades it was, you know, the, the guy who was slaughtering innocents uh, in the Far East. And today, in the case of a pension fund, the person or people you're supposed to look after as a pension trustee are the members, active members, retired members. Your fiduciary obligation tells you, in essence, you cannot come to the table to represent yourself. That is wrong. Come to the table, to the fiduciary table, to look after others, in this case, the pension beneficiaries. And we see fiduciary obligations having some currency in Canada. The federal government has fiduciary obligations vis a vis. First Nations, parents have fiduciary obligations vis-a-vis -vis kids. There are all kinds of instances in which fiduciary obligations arise under our system of law. But it's exceptional to this basic approach that our legal system has constructed itself upon, which is self-interest and rational. So that, that's number one. And that's when we talk, talk through the cases at a high level, you'll see where, how the courts think about the obligations of a fiduciary, not to themselves, but to these other people, how they think about these other people, how they think about their interests and the obligations of the trustees, these to be those folks. So the second thing I'm going to say is in self-defense. Before we get too far, what do lawyers do? I'm a lawyer. I'm not a judge. I'm not a legislator. What, is the, what do we do? Essentially, what we do is we advise a client about the law. And what does that mean? That means, in this context, 
what would a judge do if you brought this situation before them? Now, we might not like very much, personally, what that judge would do. Or we might. It doesn't matter. Our job is to tell our client what that judge would do. You know, that judge might put you in jail. That judge might levy a fine. That judge might declare that you breached a fiduciary obligation, or that judge might say, that's good, you did a good job, no problem. Our job is to predict that as best we can, so that you don't find yourselves in one of the former situations, you find yourself in one of the latter situations. <laughs> that's our job, right? So that's what I'm here to do now, and that's what I do earlier today. Uh, so don't, please don't mistake uh, the advice that you get from me or from another lawyer with the deeply held personal beliefs that the individual may have. So, <laughs> that's the self-defense part. So, so let's talk a little bit quickly about some of the leading cases in, the, in this area which we can call responsible investment. Um, when I started practicing, which was a long time ago, uh, there weren't, uh, it wasn't a big industry, it was a small industry. There were not very many people who were concerned about what we would now call responsible investment. For the most part, the people who were uh, concerned about it were thinking about things like investing in armaments, investing in tobacco, investing in alcohol, companies that produce, <coughs> produce alcoholic beverages. They were the sin kind of industries and certain program attached to them and certain constituencies wanted nothing to do with them and so they wanted their pension boards to not hold securities. So we went through, that was, that was probably characteristic of this industry until say 2000 or so, in my experience, perhaps a little bit different elsewhere. And then of course in the early part of the new millennium we had some very fundamental things began to change. Began to change. Uh, we had the corporate scandals of Enron, WorldCom, Tyco, and so on and so forth, are too, too numerous to mention. <laughs> Enormous, significant, foundational, uh, structural scandals leading to, to financial crisis. And people sitting in pension boardrooms who held shares in these companies, some of which went bankrupt, like WorldCom and Enron, began to say to themselves, we have an interest in governance, you know? It matters to us, it matters that these companies are properly governed because it, it, it affects the value of these securities, ultimately affects the value of our investments. And, they, and, and the other foundational change that began to, I think, become quite important in people's consciousness was climate change on the environment side. A whole raft of, of environmental issues, but no one issue more important than climate change. Irreversible, the prospect of irreversible uh, climate change for a long-term investor in a pension fund who's supposed to have assets out there uh, indefinitely because their liabilities go virtually indefinitely. People had to begin to think about climate change and about the impact of climate change on their security holdings, on their investments, on their strategies. And there's always been a social dynamic and that social dynamic expanded. It, it was originally, I think, largely focused on the sin industries, but it began to look at labor conditions, and it began to look at community relations and community development issues. Of course, the South Africa issues were very, very important to, to these folks, too, in the, especially in the AIDS. So we had burgeoning issues that, through the latter part, through the latter part of the 80s to the 90s, and especially in the 2000s, really broadened out what we were talking about when we talked about first social responsible investment, now uh, ESG. So the cases that uh, I'll speak briefly about in the remaining two or three minutes uh, are uh, of an earlier era. They're from the 70s and the 80s, but they, they're they interesting to me, uh, first of all, because they haven't been overturned, there haven't been very many recent cases. Most of the recent thinking I'll come to in the second part of this uh, chat uh, is, is not thinking within the courtroom. It's, it's, it's thinking of other institutional arrangements. Um, the first one is a case ca called Cowan and Scargill, which anyone who sat on a pension board has heard of all too many times. So this is a case that erupted uh, under Margaret Thatcher when uh, Arthur uh, Scargill, who was president of the Miners uh, Union in the UK, was uh, a trustee on their pension fund 
and together with other uh, trustees appointed by the National Union of Miners, promoted an investment policy for the coal miners pension fund that said, we will not invest overseas, we will not invest in industries that compete with coal. Okay. The clear purpose of these rules, these, these proposed investment rules, was to promote the coal industry, was to protect employment of coal miners, or members of this plant. This is a lot of totally alien thought. Um, now, on the other side of this ultimately was Margaret Thatcher. This was a highly political kind of a case. Uh, so the board split. Uh, the, appoint the trustees appointed by the mine workers promoted this policy. The trustees appointed by the employers opposed it. They wound up in court. And uh, the judgment was uh, savage. The court made abundantly clear in every way it could that this was improper. And it was improper because of the fiduciary paradigm that the court applied and articulated, which was that as trustees, the responsibility of the board was to look after not the interests of whoever sits on the board, but the interests of the membership. Now, you're still puzzled because the membership are coal miners. Okay, The membership is to be thought of when we come to financial trusts as having a singular interest, and that is financial. It's a financial trust. Pension plan is considered in this case to be a financial trust. It delivers financial benefits, money at the end of the day, and the interests of the plan members were thought of as financial. Financial vis-a-vis -vis the pension plan. And recall that although many of the members of the plan would have been active coal miners, a lot of members would have been retired. They would have had no immediate personal interest in continued employment. Maybe their, their kids were going to be employed, but they themselves probably had exhausted their, their lifetime for them. So the court said, you know, really what you're doing, uh, trustees, is you are being ideological and you're bringing your personal views to bear on these investment decisions, and they have no place at this board game because your, your uh, obligation is to look after the best financial interests of the beneficiaries of this fund. So there was no sympathy at all for what, uh, for what the coal miners were trying to do. They lost. And that continues, in my view, to be the high watermark of impossibility, shall we say, difficulty in pursuing uh, these objectives. Now, there have been a couple other cases out of the UK which I'm not going to spend a lot of time on. They, can, they, they, they deal with uh, either charitable trusts, which are a little bit different because they're not, strictly speaking, financial trusts. And the courts wrestle with this because charitable trusts have a pot of money, and they invest that money, and they earn returns, and they use those returns to promote their charitable causes. But at the same time, they have charitable objectives, which are social objectives. And so people keep saying, how can you, the Cancer Society, this is not a real case, just an example, how can you, the Cancer Society, hold shares in a tobacco company, even if that tobacco company is highly profitable, you're making a lot of money, it really conflicts with your objective, doesn't it? And the courts have some sympathy for that. So there, there is an exception in, uh, for charitable trust, which doesn't particularly bear on us as, as pension, uh, as pension industry people. Uh, the, other, uh, the other cases that I want to talk about for a minute concern the South African investment uh, issue in the 80s. And these are interesting. I mean, the, there's, there's a case in the UK uh, in which the court uh, did not endorse uh, a divestment, uh, a divestment uh, proposal by, by a board, uh, really on the basis that the board hadn't thought it through. They hadn't gone out and got professional advice. They hadn't measured what the financial impact on the beneficiaries, on the fund, and ultimately on the beneficiaries might be. Very much process oriented. The more interesting case is the <coughs> US case uh, that I'll refer to as the City of Baltimore case, which was the Maryland Court of Appeal. Uh, so you know Baltimore, you know Maryland, and you remember what things were like. Most of you, I can tell, will remember what things were like in the US in that period of time. A lot of ferment uh, on, comp on campuses and among the population, especially among uh, in, the, in, in black areas. So there was um, a huge divestiture movement, divestment movement in the United States. And the city of Baltimore, city, the city council, 
passed ordinances uh, directing the trustees of their pension funds to divest of companies with substantial operations in South Africa. And this was going to be a big deal. They were going to have to sell 120 of the 500 stocks in the S&P 500. There were going to be costs associated with that. Uh, investment managers wouldn't be able to buy those stocks. They'd have to buy other stocks. They'd have to do more research and different things. There'd be costs associated with all that. And all that would, the evidence was led about all that. So there was, there was a good amount of professional advice that was brought to bear and thought analysis that was brought to bear. Uh, and they were clever about the way they did it. And this is where lawyers can be helpful. So what they said is, uh, you have to sell all your, the ordinance has told the trustees, they have to sell all the securities and companies that did business in South Africa. But if they concluded that this was going to be harmful to the fund, then they could pause. They could pause for a period of time. And then the pause would come to an end and they'd have to start divesting. But they could pause again if they concluded that, that the investment was going to be uh, harmful. So what this effectively did is it reversed the onus. Instead of having to come to court to say, we will be better off if we sell these things, you say to the other side, you have to prove that we would be worse off if we sell these things. And the trustees, are very, this is very difficult to do. I mean, this, this is, as you'll appreciate, somewhat ideological, uh, based on um, somewhat ideological presumptions. So at the end of the day, what the court said was interesting. Uh, what they said was, yes, there are costs to this, and yes, these costs are not good. It has nothing to do with the pension fund. It has nothing to do with the financial interests of the beneficiaries. This is really alien. It's really an alien objective for a pension fund. But they said, the costs are de minimis. Something like one sixteenth of one percent from one of the one of the costs. Very very small costs. They said they were de, uh, de minimis. Now. You know, in theory, de minimis, not de minimis, doesn't matter, right? In theory, if you're a purist uh, and you're looking after the best financial interests of the beneficiaries, then any, any incremental cost is a bad thing. There's just no justification for it. But the reality was that in the context of that time, this court was prepared, and this is a good appeal court, was prepared to say, that's okay. The minimum, minimal cost to achieve this objective are okay. And, and what that suggests to me uh, is that courts are sensitive at the margin, maybe at the margin is the wrong word, but in certain circumstances to what's going on in the world, to changing social norms, to political strife, to conflict. Uh, and so you begin to ask yourself if a, if a pension fund, for example, adopted a policy that said, we will not hold shares in companies that exploit child labor. That is a pretty offensive thing to exploit child labor. Can we imagine going to court, having a judge say, no, no, no. You have to invest in these companies because that's how you're going to make money to pay pensions to the financial beneficiaries. Frankly, I cannot imagine a judge doing that. They're human beings, and there are limits, and there are social norms that are incorporated and, and reflected in, in this area of law. But in its pure form, the pure form of fiduciary obligation, there's really no place for it, for, for a moral precept, for a, an investment decision that is driven not by a risk or return consideration, but is rather driven by a moral concern, not a political concern. And that's what was illustrated in the Calvin Scarborough. Okay, so why don't I stop there, and Simon will take the next chunk, and then I'll say something. Very good. Something I forgot to say at the end, but that you said a little bit about quickly, but that is worth just reiterating is um, uh, fiduciary duty, uh, it was a malleable con a concept, and in Canada, which didn't happen in the UK or in the US nearly to the same degree, or maybe even in the same type, uh, the courts began in 1980 employing the concept outside the traditional trustee type relationships. So you would, Murray mentioned a couple of them, uh, there's a fiduciary duty on the government to act in the best interest of the duty of loyalty with respect to aboriginal matters. And that's been litigated in a dozen different ways and was sort of world leading uh, case law for a long time. Uh, 
and also parent and children, uh, also uh, financial advisor and advisee, and a whole bunch of other uh, categories uh, outside the normal ones we're used to seeing, which is a trustee where there's a piece of property involved, or something like a doctor and a patient, or a lawyer and a client where there's an obvious a, in a, we call it information asymmetry. And yes, uh, uh, one, of the, one of the judges in the case called Frome, just as Wilson said, yes, anywhere there's a vulnerability, a peculiar vulnerability or um, a power imbalance between the person with the fiduciary duty and uh, the person who's owed that duty, uh, we will sometimes impose that duty. And so that works in some places. Uh, my daughter is uh, unsurprised to find out that I have a fiduciary duty towards her. Uh, but when you're in the middle of an arm's length uh, uh, commercial transaction in which you're negotiating over uh, mining that property, uh, up pops this duty from time to time. And Murray was adverting to this and saying that this duty is one that, you know, where you're required to act or a court you know, uh, two and a half years after the event will require that you acted in the best interest of the commercial counterparty that you're otherwise trying to kind of enter a shark-like deal with. <laughs> there, there are two different kinds of deals, right? And so uh, after a while, the development of this case law uh, began to be questioned by, by folks in commercial circles, but also everywhere else. Has the pendulum swung too far with the expansion of this fiduciary duty concept, this duty to act in other folks' interests? And there's lots of literature out there that can refer to, to you two later. But what's so interesting about that is this Canadian case law, which is sort of way out there um, from the rest of the common law world, um, is now becoming suddenly a little bit more relevant again when, when we start looking at the ways in which a fiduciary duty may help us think through um, what we're calling a public fiduciary issues or post general financial crisis issues as we try and find ways to uh, combat short-termism in investment behaviors and emphasize long-termism, for example, talk a bit more about it. But before we get there, we get to one of the places in which um, uh, uh, the, it, you, the, the trade union, but even just broader interest in uh, socially responsible investing, also the responsible investing world, um, is rooted. And that's in a term called universal ownership, uh, which was uh, first coined, I believe, um, uh, by, uh, let me just see here, uh, right, Robert Monks and Nell Minow in, a, is it Minow? Minow? in um, 1995 in a book they wrote on corporate governance. And so what's universal ownership? And then we'll get to that book and where it's coming from. Um, it's the proposal that um, uh, investors with large diversified portfolios, so you can guess who they are, um, will include investments in many sectors of the economy such that their portfolio and long-term interests should be aligned with, so saith Monks and Minow, uh, the, the broader uh, e you know, economy's interests. Um, uh, they, they call it owning a slice of the economy. And so what's good for your portfolio is good for the economy as a whole, and what grows one grows the other. It's, all, it's almost not, you know, there's nothing too sophisticated about that proposal, um, but it gets extended by a couple of folks later. I won't talk about how it gets extended, and Murray's going to talk about current formations of it and challenges to it, but it, it goes from your portfolio's interests are the same as the broader <coughs> economic interests, not just investment by investment, but portfolio. Um, um, and those interests are more than just uh, sometimes a sole focus on rate of return. They're interested in uh, measuring um, uh, economic life as a whole. Um, one uh, a, a group even called it public interest, which anyone who's done any kind of administrative law knows is just the undefinable term. There's no way what is it? But it, exactly. So who's public interest, so to speak? Right? In fact, interesting sort of. Habermasian speculation as to where the word public comes from in the, in, in the beginning. Um, but that's, so these folks in 1995 are writing a corporate governance textbook. They come across this term and they say, this is how we align shareholder interests, which is kind of the thing they're looking at in their corporate governance textbook with broader public interests, or at least economy-wide interests. And uh, so I thought, well, what is an interesting way to come at this idea and give us a few tools to understand it a little better? And, and I thought it was, well, what are they talking about when they're talking about corporate governance? And, and one of the central chestnuts of corporate governance, it's already been mentioned today in the room, and I guess was mentioned a bit in your last session, is the agency gap, the separation of ownership and control. What happens when the folks in charge of the money, or the corporation, or whatever it is we're talking about, are distant or have different interests or aren't accountable in some way to the folks who own it. And I have to put that in quotation marks because everyone who talks about it talks about the weakness of ownership and the lack of real control. And this was first or most famously identified as a problem in corporate law 
and corporate governance um, by Burley and Means in a famous book in 1932 uh, called Modern Corporation and Private Property, in which they studied the legal structure of corporations and they said, you know what, shareholders who own it and are notionally owning and controlling what goes on in a corporation don't really have any power. The structure of the, you know, the legal structure of the corporation separates them from control, and we have a manage, managers can exploit it to their own individual self-interest and not do things that are good for the corporate. Sound all familiar? Sound familiar as folks interested in pensions? So they first articulated and they set off essentially a century's worth of speculation about how to close the agency gap. Um, and, uh, and the book's worth a read even today. It's, it's a really terrific book. The two things that they, they don't pick a way to close it. They don't come out and say, and here's what we got to do to fix it. They just sort of suggest two ways that it could be fixed maybe. And, and one is to uh, fix um, the law of agency, really. How to make a fiduciary more accountable to the beneficiary. How can we close that gap? How can we hold them to higher standards and law, get them to know your interests better, do things that you would want them to do otherwise? because you can't control them day to day. And the other is they say, or we have to kind of regulate. They say corporations, the really big ones with the really disparate shareholders, are really little governments. And they really should have sets of rules that are, are about being little governments. And they don't really say too much about it. It's 1932, there's lots of stuff in the air. And you know, it's a, a New York uh, top end uh, a corporate theorist talking, he's not going to come out and say public ownership. We won't get to that until we get to John Galbraith in 1969, who says, sure, nationalize the top 500. But, but that's in the air, you know, what else are we going to do about it? And I think it's an interesting thing to keep in the air because what are we going to do about this agency gap or this fiduciary problem? And this, of course, is something we're not allowed to talk about anymore, right? This re-regulation option. But anyway, or God forbid, public, public ownership option. What it leads to, and I'm just going to try to speed through this since Murray's got some more particulars here. Um, by the time you get to the 1980s, closing the agency gap means empowering shareholders. And that's what uh, Monks and Minow were talking about in 1995. It's actually Michael Jensen in 1988 who says, you know what, if we just gave everyone who works in a corporation shares, including top management, lots of shares, we'd all be aligned. Uh, you know, stock options are the way to go. We'd all be aligned and they'll be maximizing stuff for everybody, which by definition of universal ownership is maximizing the economy as a, as a whole and you know, sort of everybody's happy. It's really, it's, it's an incredibly idealistic way to look at things. And of course, you know what we got sort of. stock options, right? And Murray's already talked a little bit about it in executive compensation issues. The current uh, incarnation of, you know, how to close that agency gap is, is um, well, Ed Waitzer calls it right now, um, uh, the public fiduciary. He's got a, a paper out there now winning awards that says we have to take the fiduciary duty concept and we have to expand it and, and fill it with public, uh, public interests or, or more responsible things. Um, and his particular concern right now is the problem of short-termism, short-term investing, which even pension funds have a problem with. They're long-term investors, but they churn equities through, and this is a problem of equity markets that we can talk about. It. The guy who may have given uh, Mr. Waitzer this idea was uh, Kay, I think it's, it's a John Kay. He wrote the Kay Report on capital markets in the UK uh, about a year ago, a year and a half ago, and he was very critical of financial intermediaries and of uh, short-termism, of asset management. He doesn't really look at the buy side. He doesn't look at pension funds that much the owners of these assets and, and the purchase side of it, but he looks at the people who manage it, who get paid to own it, and he has nothing good to say, and he says, you know, we've got to re-examine fiduciary duty. If we imposed it on these guys and they took it seriously, they would probably act better in long-term interest, more sensitive to their principles, which are pension funds, and uh, it might do the job. And I, I think this is a rosy economist view in the sort of the same way that Michael Jensen had a, a kind of a rosy view about stock options and lending interest of what uh, fiduciary duty can do to discipline behaviors. Um, but that's the current moment um, uh, that we're in. And in fact, there's a British Law Commission right now looking at exactly that question. Let me just see if I have one more. I do have one more technical thing uh, to leave you with. 1969, Burley, who first coined uh, separation of ownership and control, um, took a look at this new phenomenon in capital markets, insurance and pension funds. And he says, oh my god, here they come. 1959, I stand corrected. He wrote a book called Power Without Property. He said, what corporations started, pension funds will finish. And that is they will completely fission the uh, atomic stuff was in the air back then. They were completely fission the beneficiary from the control of it. 
And he says, this is a huge problem. But it wasn't the agency gap part of that book that actually turned out to be really interesting. It was the part about what are capital markets for anymore. And he said, you know what? Corporations don't raise money on capital markets anymore. 75% of the money that they need to do their business is internal, is raised internally through retained earnings, depreciation, other kinds of things like that. In fact, capital markets, he was just beginning to perceive. And Kay, about 40 or 50 years later, comes in and says, yep, that's what happened. Um, shed shareholders now. They're really there for moving around shareholder interests in an ownership, in ownership interests and sort of shuffling the decks way, but we don't go out and raise money, put it to productive use, and then return that money to shareholders and do it. That doesn't happen anymore. We shed and we concentrate. We create conditions of oligopoly in the buy side and, and the management side in, in uh, capital markets in cases. This is a big problem. So then the question becomes, will changing the content of fiduciary duty have an effect on actors in oligopolic, oligopolistic conditions or not? Or, or what are the things that can properly affect the social outcomes we're interested in responding under those conditions? There's only a few sellers, there's only a few buyers, and they own everything. And they're mostly not about raising money for productive uses anymore. They're mostly just about shuffling and holding assets and trying to maintain or gain their prices on the market. I don't know the answer to that. And, and, and I hope Murray does. <laughs> <laughs> So what I want to talk about here is where we are, where I think we're at, Canada internationally, in this phase, and sort of post uh, to that post economic financial crisis of the early 2000s, and then post the bigger financial crisis of 2008, 2009. There are lots of theories in the air, but when you look at what's actually going on, uh, I think this is it. I think there's 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 more. There's more stuff. There are more dynamics. There are more initiatives, but. This, uh, this, these three pages here uh, are the principles for responsible investment uh, that have been put together under the auspices of the United Nations PRI, Principles for Responsible Investment uh, Project. Uh, they have been signed onto by literally trillions of dollars, international pension, charity, and trust dollars. In Canada, the Canada Pension Plan Investment Board is a signatory. The Teachers Pension Plan is a, is a signatory. Uh, the Keston de Poe is a signatory. British Columbia Investment Management Corporation is a signatory. Omers is a signatory. It can go on and on. All the big, powerful uh, pension funds in this country are comfortable with this. This expresses their view as to where we're at when it comes to non-financial criteria. So recall from the first segment that when these issues first hit the courts, it was generally in connection with moral or political objectives that people were trying to work into a pension fund mandate. Whether that was employment for coal workers or whether it was divestment from South Africa, really had nothing to do with an investment objective. It had to do with a moral political objective. And that's that's where the paradigm was distilled, in cases that that considered whether you could do that. And then the field changed, it became dominated by much bigger players, it was not so peripheral as it was when I started 30 years ago, it became quite mainstream. You're looking now at maybe 20% of assets that are managed under some model of responsible investing in this country. Uh, big pension funds signed on mainstream institutions signatory to it. And, and what gave birth to this sort of new phase, I, I think, was largely the scandals of uh, 2000, the early 2000s, the environmental crisis, and continued social pressure in a number of areas. So these institutions get together, they're advised by experts, they come up with these principles, and they've now been adopted uh, internationally by literally uh, trillions of dollars. So quickly, let's just run through them and see what they are. And the fundamental change that you'll observe right away is that unlike in the 80s when we were litigating whether you could consider non-financial criteria for political or moral reasons, but not financial reasons, we are now asking a different question. And it is whether you can consider uh, non-financial criteria for economic reasons. Whether we can consider and how we can consider non-financial criteria in order to enhance investment returns or reduce investment risks in our in, in pension portfolios. That is now the question. It is not so much about divestment, it is not so much about 
uh, anything but risk and return. So these factors have now moved center stage. They are now being integrated into the investment decision making process in much the same way as financial factors are, have been integrated. And the debate, which is not really a debate, is, or the question, is you know, whether a prudent fiduciary, someone who's looking out for the interests of the, of the beneficiaries, can, or even should, or even must, consider non-financial factors alongside financial factors. And the clear answer from the UNPRI, from the institutions that are signatory to it, is yes, of course. You know, if we're going to buy an Exxon, for example, we have to be cognizant of its balance sheet, but we also have to be cognizant of yes. its environmental record. I mean, otherwise we're being irresponsible. We're not fulfilling our prudent fiduciary mandate because we're not looking at all the risks. And that's what, that's where we are at, and you'll see how that plays out in the UNPRI. So, principle number one. We will incorporate ESG, as Kevin said, environmental, social, and governance criteria into investment analysis and decision-making processes. Okay, so the idea here is we're going to pay attention to the sense. And in order to do that, we have to make some changes because part of the problem that these folks recognize is that while corporations under securities laws are required to produce financial statements and to disclose financial metrics, discuss financial metrics, they're not necessarily required to disclose non-financial things. They don't have to talk about child labor. They don't have to talk about their environmental record. They don't have to talk about a whole range of social issues that may come back to haunt them in one way, shape, or form. So frankly, one of the things that needs to be done if you're going to integrate these non-financial factors into investment decision-making at the highest level is you have to start at the bottom and you have to force disclosure as to what's going on. And in order to force disclosure, you have to have criteria and you have to have metrics. And not only you have to have criteria and metrics, but they have to be more or less uniform. Because if everybody's disclosing in their own, in their own way, in their own world, on their own terms, you don't have anything that is particularly insightful or, or that is comparable. So, for example, there's been the emergence of SASB, the Sustainability Accounting Standards Board, which is so far it doesn't do very much. But what they aspire to do is lay out a series of precise metrics and standards against which corporations can be measured, to which they'll have to disclose, so that when you look at an annual report, it will not simply be a series of financial statements, but it will be a more qualitative disclosure of non-financial criteria. So, we're going to incorporate the ideas, we're going to incorporate these, these criteria, we're going to compel disclosure of these uh, uh, criteria. Uh, principle number two, we're going to be active owners and incorporate ESG issues into our ownership policies and practices. And active ownership is uh, a much more current deal now than it was, say, 20 years ago. It used to be the case that pension funds would buy securities analyze the company that didn't like what was going on, they'd sell it. Um, or that was the ideology of it. And then they recognized, uh, through Peter Drucker's work and work subsequent to that, that they actually, you know, they couldn't, that was a shell game. They could sell, sell shares in this one and then buy shares in that one. And they were all pretty much uh, just circulating shares. And if they were really going to, to improve performance, they had to hold these shares act like active owners, take an ownership interest, and begin to exert the pressure that ownership, in theory, uh, can generate. So active ownership means you, uh, you meet with management, you uh, put shareholder resolutions on the floor, you, you, know, you try to influence uh, to the degree that you can uh, management practices. And uh, let's not be naive, I mean, it's, uh, it's certainly possible that, uh, that a pension fund would exercise that, that authority power uh, in order to improve an environmental practice, for example, but it's also possible that they would act much like a hedge fund acts to try to make the corporation more acute, reduce its costs, improve its profitability, quite apart from any social and political objective. Mm -hmm. and, and we're certainly seeing both things, both things. Um, 
Uh, principle number three, we will seek appropriate disclosure on ESG issues by the entities in which we invest. Uh, I've discussed this a little bit. This is a little bit about, uh, about compelling disclosure at the corporate level, because without that disclosure, you don't have the information that you need to work it up. Principle four, we will promote acceptance and implementation of the principles within the investment industry. So, not, so now that, you know, in theory, you've, you've uh, provoked disclosure at the corporate level, you want uh, analysts who work for brokerage companies, for investment analysts, to pick this information up, to assimilate it into their analyses and their reports, and to generate uh, buy or sell recommendations using not only financial data, but also non-financial criteria. Principle five, we will work together to enhance our effectiveness in implementing the principles. We're now getting into the very, very soft uh, number of the PRI, so it recognizes that there is a dynamic here that these principles will evolve and change, and they, will, they are committed to, to that process. And principle six uh, is a, a principle in which they acknowledge that they will report and be accountable to somebody uh, about how these things are going to evolve. So. Uh, this is really uh, this is really the current moment mm -hmm. in uh, the use, the consideration of non-financial criteria by pension funds in investment decision making. Now, there are lots of ways that they go about it, more or less, but uh, these these ideas, these principles, uh, have in many uh, pension fund minds merged this issue of non-financial criteria into the risk return investment paradigm, into the appropriate construction of a portfolio under the prudent person rule. All that this has done is, is, is increased the number of factors that you look at, broaden the perspective, recognize that there are risks that can materialize or advantages that can occur. Uh, due not only to financial dynamics, but to non-financial uh, uh, dynamics. So this is, in my view, where we're at. This is, uh, this is now the cutting edge, has been probably for seven or eight years. Uh, and much of the rest of what's going on is, is interesting, but this is what our pension funds have signed on to, this is what they say they're committed to, and this is what, to some degree, uh, they're doing. Uh, so, just to bring things up to see. Very good.